Hello, I'm Hushcho, and welcome to So Wrong, So Right. In this show, I perform dramatic readings of series-based fiction, including, but not always limited to, official tie-in novels. This week we have Supernatural Nevermore by Keith R. A. De Candido. This is an official novel based around the series Supernatural, and set during season two. That's also one of the reasons why I'm reading it, because personally, I really enjoyed season one and season two way more than what it became later. So, without further ado, let's get started. Chapter one with Supernatural Nevermore. First, I'm going to read the dedication and anything else that happens before, then we'll get on to it. The late great Scott Mooney, for informing so much of the music of my childhood, to John, Jack, Ray, Doug, Kathy, Janice... Arlene, Kevin, and all the other nutjobs on the paper, Fordham University's alternative paper, who gave me my first great publishing experience. To Edgar Allan Poe, who lived a hard life, but whose groundbreaking work will live on forever. And in general to the Bronx, the place where I was born and lived, the place where I grew up, the place where I was educated, and still New York's best-kept secret. Boogie down. As you may know, I'm not a huge fan of New York, but I'm not sure what secrets are kept in the Bronx. I'm not sure I want to know. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. Edgar Allan Poe, The Telltale Heart. Out of context, that just sounds comical to me. You know, it's like, I heard all the, I, I heard it all in heaven and earth. I heard everything, girl. But in hell, you know, I heard some things. You know what, you know what happens. You know, you hang out, you hear a thing or two, a thing or two. This novel takes place between the second season supernatural episodes, Crossroad Blues and Croatoan. 1. Fordham University. The Bronx, New York. Sunday, 12th November, 2006. You know, with that foreword, you have to kind of think that may be just the reason why he said it here. It's just like, right, well, you know, here it is. We're in the Bronx. Chill November breeze blew John Soto's hair into his face. Mother Nature's reminder to get a haircut in the absence of his actual mother being around to nag him about it. Wear a hat, dude. Get a hairband or something. She was back in Ohio where it was safe and also 10 degrees colder than it was here in the Bronx. If Emily Soda could see her son's shaggy mop of brown hair, she'd make that clicking noise she always made and offer to call to make the haircutting appointment herself. John loved attending Fordham University for about a thousand reasons, but its considerable distance from his mother numbered high on that list. Alright, so I guess we're establishing a relatable main character for this chapter, because everybody knows that the people who appear in the first, like, five minutes of any supernatural episode are either destined to die or destined to go through some sort of horrible experience. He and his roommate, Kevin Bear, were heading back to their off-campus apartment after a long day in the print shop in the basement of the McKinley Center. They were the co-editors of Fordham's alternative paper and had spent most of the day putting the latest bi-weekly issue to bed. The files had been emailed to the printer and they would have the issues by Tuesday morning. That was critical, as they had to get it out before the RAM, Fordham's stodgy official student newspaper, especially because of the exclusive they got from the Dean. So this seems like this is just someone setting up a story based on his own college experience. Still, they always say write what you know, but it's sort of like, you could have done a little different, maybe. I don't know. I don't know how this is going to go down, but I just have to say that, like, so far it's kind of like, you could have... You could have tried a little bit more. <laughs> they were walking quickly through the campus. You know, English teachers saying, I, I, I hear the voices echoing in my, in my head, you know. Less B verbs with ING, more active voice. They walked quickly through the campus. Heading towards the exit at Belmont Avenue by Faculty Memorial Hall. We don't need to know this stuff. Like, we literally do not need to know the specific avenue and the specific location until and unless it actually becomes relevant. From there, it was only a few blocks to their battered, cluttered, tiny, but blissfully cheap apartment on Camberlang Avenue. Once they hit the exit, John brushed the hair out of his face and said, Come on, let's motor. I want to get home and change for the party. What party? Amy's party, remember? I can only presume this isn't the delicious Amy's organic that do those wonderful dinners. Kevin winced. I got an A30 class tomorrow morning, dude. I can't. Shrugging, John said, Blow it off. No way. Dr. Mendez will have my ass. Seriously, she takes attendance. I already missed three classes because of production weekends. I can't miss another one. They had come to the corner of Belmont Avenue and Fordham Road and had to wait for the light. The traffic was sufficiently heavy, even this late on a Sunday, so they couldn't cross against the light. Prior to senior year, 
John had lived in the on-campus dorms, which were part of the lush greenery that characterized Fordham's campus, an oasis of academe in the midst of the largest city in the world. Well, not the midst. The Bronx was the northernmost part of New York City, just above Manhattan and Queens, and the only part of the city attached to the mainland. Again, this is stuff we don't strictly need to know. I know a lot of people don't know about, like, the minutiae and the details of New York City, but this just screams of padding. Like, I needed to up the word count, and I thought I'd talk about something that I knew and didn't have to research. It's good to have the detail, but at the same time, it's kind of irrelevant, and it slightly takes away from direct involvement in what these two people are doing. Like, we really don't care about Amy's party or their classes, but at the same time, that is actually relevant to what's happening, because these are characters that we're supposed to get invested in when something inevitably happens to them. The geography of New York is not something that is directly relevant to this, and it's not something that we need to know, or at least hopefully we don't need to know, to enjoy the rest of the story. Before visiting Fordham during his senior year of high school, John had always assumed New York to be Manhattan. He had no idea of the outer boroughs, and was thrilled to find himself in a neighborhood that by itself was a more exciting city than Cleveland could ever be. Again, again, it tries to tie it into the character, but it's ultimately kind of irrelevant. The transition still messed with his head a little, though. Fordham's campus was old trees and grass and a mix of old and new buildings, some dating back to the university's founding in the 19th century. We don't need to know this! Others late 20th century editions, and wouldn't have been out of place in a sleepy town somewhere in New England. Then you step through the wrought iron gates and were hit with a cacophony of cars and buses zipping down Fordham Road, or crawling if it was rush hour, pedestrians, gas stations, fast food joints, car repair shops, and people. See, this is good stuff. I like this stuff. This takes you directly into it, and you can see and hear and feel what's going on. This isn't a history lesson or a geography lesson. This is telling you how it is and giving you an idea of where they are. The neighborhood was a mix of Italians who had come in the early 20th century, Latinos who came in the 1960s, and Albanians who came in the 1980s. Just down the street in one direction was Sears, Fordham Plaza, and the Metro North Train. The other way, the Department of Motor Vehicles, the Bronx Zoo, and the Botanical Gardens. The Little Italy neighborhood still thrived, filled with delis, wine stores, restaurants, bakeries, pasta shops, and the occasional street fair, and John had gained five pounds that semester just by moving closer to the source of cannolis. Again, we don't need to know most of this. The Little Italy thing, if that's actually in any way relevant to anything else that's going to happen, that's great. It is amusing to note, and relevant to the character and the development of the character, that John had gained five pounds because he likes Cannoli. That makes us care about the character a little bit, because it makes them more relatable and more human. I like that. The rest of it, you don't need to know. Unless Sam and Dean are going to be later discussing about, hmm, we need to go to Sears or the Metro North train. Oh no, Sammy, we should go to the Department of Motor Vehicles or the Bronx Zoo, you know, like... <laughs> That's not going to come up later. Of course, on a late Sunday night, there are almost no people on the street, just the cars. Which is kind of a misleading statement, because there are obviously people in the cars. And, as you've already stated, it's late on Sunday, yet for some reason there's tremendous traffic. And while there may not be people walking around, there are still people. So it might have been better to say, there are almost no pedestrians, no other people walking, something like that. The light changed and Kevin and John ran across the street, since it was already blinking with the red hand indicating don't walk before they made it halfway. Don't walk should really have quotes in it. Why'd you take a Monday morning class anyhow? John asked. You knew you'd be that late most Sundays. It was the only medieval lit class I could take. Only other one was opposite the Shakespeare seminar, and that's a two-parter that I gotta take part two of next semester. Kind of awkward phrasing there, but who's to say that he couldn't have said it that way? They turned to walk up Fordham to Camberling. And you're not taking a medieval lit class next semester? Why exactly? Because Dr. Mendez will be on sabbatical, and that means Father O'Sullivan. John, who was a history major and therefore had no clue about the English department, scratched his chin. He needed a shave, something else his mother'd be on his ass about, where she here? Said, yeah, and? Another really kind of awkwardly phrased paragraph. Kevin's eyes got wide. Father O'Sullivan's had tenure since, like, the Dark Ages. Middle Ages. Middle Ages. What? It wasn't the Dark Ages, John said defensively. They don't call it that anymore. It's called... Dude, the Roman Empire had indoor plumbing. The Holy Roman Empire peed out their windows. It was the Dark Ages. John gritted his teeth and was about to respond, but Kevin got back to his original topic. 
Father O'Sullivan got tenure in, I swear to God, 1946. They turned on to Camberling. Dude, my father was born in 1946. My point, the man's a freaking fossil. No way am I taking a class with him. Whatever. John didn't really care all that much. Which we could probably surmise from the dismissive response. You should still come to the party. No way, I need my beauty rest. John grinned. Ain't enough sleep in the world to make that happen. Ooh, girl. Bite me entirely, dude. I have never heard anyone <laughs> utter that statement in my life. Maybe I'm just not around the right people. Another breeze gusted and John had to push the hair out of his face again. Dude, get a hat. Just like, just get a hat. Every douchebag and his brother has a hat. Why don't you have a hat? The farther they got from Fordham Road, the quieter it became, as Camberlane was entirely residential. Most of the block was filled with red brick three-story townhouses that were a few feet in from the street, a postage stamp front area separated from the sidewalk by a waist-high wrought iron fence. The rest of the block had five-story apartment buildings. Fewer buildings went higher than that, since once you went above five floors, city law required you put in an elevator. Many of the windows on the block were dark, and John and Kevin were the only people on the sidewalk. Well, I'm still going, since I had the brains to arrange a proper schedule, where my first Monday class is at 12.30, which means party. Kevin chuckled. Dude, Britt's not going to jump jack for you. John tensed up. In fact, hitting on Britt was at the top of his list of things to do at Amy's party, but he saw no reason to share that with his roommate. Britt's going to be there? Don't even. Don't even, girl. You lie like I snowboard. You don't snowboard. My point. John started to say whatever, but he'd already said that. Well, you know, he already just said my point, too. And he hated repeating himself. Kevin may have been fond of that doofy catchphrase, my point. Oh, which he used all the damn time. But John liked to be verbally diverse. Funny that you mentioned that. That was the thing he always nailed in the articles he edited for the paper. Repetition. You kept people interested by saying different things, not by using the same tired phrases. It was why he didn't like most stand-up comics and sketch comedians. They'd get some kind of catchphrase and then it would become expected and desired and the routine wouldn't be about being funny anymore, but about building to the catchphrase. That wasn't entertainment, that was conditioning. Again, this is interesting stuff, and this does actually apply to the character, although I have this weird feeling like this is just the author speaking through a character, but this isn't really stuff that grabs you and makes you want to go, oh, I want to know more about this. What the hell's that? Kevin was pointing at something, and John followed his finger to the plastic garbage cans in front of one of the townhouses. It looked like someone was rummaging through the garbage. Sadly, that wasn't so unusual a sight. There were plenty of homeless people around, and they'd often go through recycling bins to find cans and bottles they could redeem at the supermarket. Then the figure raised its head, and John saw that it wasn't a homeless guy. They both stopped walking as they realized that it was some sort of simian. That's a baboon, John said. Dude, that's an orangutan, John frowned. You sure? Pretty sure. The baboon or orangutan, whatever it was, looked over at them, opened its mouth, and hissed. Both John and Kevin stepped back a pace or two. John whispered, Dude, do orangutans hiss? No, but I don't think baboons do either. Why are we whispering? Before John could answer that, the... Oh, hell, he just called it a monkey until he found out for sure. Picked up the garbage can and threw it onto the street. Unfortunately, the lid was off, so a torn garbage bag came rolling out, spilling rotten food, empty containers, and other stuff onto the pavement. John said, You got your cell? Kevin nodded. Good, because my battery's dead. Who the hell am I supposed to call, lost and found? Not taking his eye off the monkey, John said. No, 911, you doof. Now call him before... Before he kills me, of course. Ha 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 ha. Suddenly, the monkey ran toward them, screeching like it was on a meth bender or something. A meth bender or something. John wanted to turn and run away, but found that he couldn't make his legs move. And it didn't matter for very long, because this monkey could give Jesse Owens a run for his money. It was on them in a second. As a general rule, John hated when he screamed. He always sounded like a girl. Proving that this was an unjust universe, his screams actually had gotten higher in pitch after his voice changed. It was embarrassing, really, so whenever he felt the urge to scream, he tried to keep his mouth shut so it came out as more of a hum. To his mind, that sounded manlier. But right now, with the crazed monkey screeching and howling and jumping on top of him and Kevin and hitting them really hard with his big hands, he screamed like a girl. He hadn't felt like this since he got in that stupid fight in high school with Harry Markham over who would be going to the prom with Jeannie Waite. The joke being, of course, that she went with that loser, Morty Johansson, so he got a black eye and a split lip for nothing. The monkey's fist pounded on him and Kevin both, and pain was just everywhere. Then one smack caught him in the side of the head, and he literally saw stars, something he used to think only happened in cartoons. 
Only when he felt the cool pavement on his cheek did John realize the monkey wasn't hitting him anymore, but he still heard screams. Rolling over, which sent a shooting pain through his side, he saw the monkey picking Kevin up and throwing him into the fence in front of one of the townhouses. Then he heard a snap. He didn't want to believe it. Couldn't believe it at first. It wasn't like a twig breaking. It wasn't like a piece of plastic snapping into. It wasn't it wasn't like anything John Soder had ever heard before. Because of that, he knew that Kevin was dead. Uh, okay. I did call it, though. No, Kevin. Okay, I'll admit I did that wrong on purpose. No, Kevin! But see, it's just written like, no. Kevin? Like, oh my god, Kevin, what are you doing? He barely noticed the orangutan or baboon or gorilla or whatever it was. It's like you're trying to be funny and someone has just probably died. Call it the simian, call it the shape, whatever you want to call it, but stop with this debate, even on the narrator's part, about what this thing is. You should know what this is. You're the author. Lumbering toward him, instead he just stared at Kevin. Lying there on the Camberlang Avenue sidewalk, his head at an impossible angle, and wondered how the hell this could possibly have happened. It couldn't have been real. Monkeys didn't just show up on the street and beat people to death. It couldn't be. The monkey leapt on top of him then and started wailing on him, and he didn't even raise an arm to defend himself because he simply couldn't believe it. The second boy took forever to die. At least the first one was taken care of quickly, but the other one, the one who kept muttering to himself after the first one died, the orangutan had to keep punching and punching until he finally gave in. Once the second one breathed his last, he spoke the incantation one final time, then stepped on the burning wormwood to put it out. Okay, this is stupid. This is really stupid. Like, it's something where, when you're an author, you don't generally like to jump between people's heads quite that quickly, especially if you're in someone's head and putting the reader in someone's head who is supposed to be the victim of this horrible thing. It's jarring and annoying. Especially since now we're apparently in whatever this thing is, its head. Given, horror is based on revulsion and we don't want to be there, but it's just not really good writing in my opinion. Keep it steady with one perspective. It doesn't make us feel more for a character if we spend a lot of time in their head and learn all these things about their history. It just makes us annoyed that you wasted our time with shit that doesn't really matter and will have absolutely no bearing on the story after this, because you had something that you didn't even identify kill them. Not the best approach. A few charred bits of wormwood leaf were left on the pavement, but the wind would scatter that in due course. And even if they found it, no one was likely to connect it to an escaped orangutan beating two people to death. It wasn't pleasant, but it was necessary, and it had to be done tonight, in the last quarter of the moon, just as the first one had to be done on the full moon on the fifth. True, they discovered the body two days later, which was sooner than he'd expected, but nobody from the constabulary, <laughs> the constabulary, you sound like me, had come to question him, so all these precautions had obviously been successful. Um, uh, who? The orangutan? Like, who are we talking about exactly? More to the point, it had to be done on this spot. The second spot of the sigil had been traced with the appropriate ritual. Once he was sure the small flame was extinguished, we are spending so much time with this flame, he stepped out from the narrow passageway between one of the townhouses and the apartment building. And wasn't it revolting the way people just tossed their garbage into the dark places, hoping nobody would notice it, and unholstered the tranquilizer gun. Taking careful aim, he shot the orangutan in the neck. It fell face first into the pavement a second later, which is totally how that happens. Running onto the sidewalk, he quickly removed the dart with a gloved hand. There would be no trace of his presence here. Turning, he ran toward his car while pulling out a disposable cell phone he'd bought earlier that afternoon, one of the delis on Arthur Avenue, and dialed 911. There's some kind of wild animal, beating two kids at Camberling and 188. Come quick! <sighs> yeah. Then he tossed the cell phone into a metal mesh garbage can on the corner of East 188th Street and got into his parked vehicle. His parked vehicle. We don't know if it's a wienermobile, a clown car, a street washer, a Zamboni. It could be... It could be a hovercraft, for all we know. A parked vehicle. Vehicle. Two down, two to go. Then, at last, the answer will be mine! Okay, that's dramatic and everything, but you mean three down. Because you did just talk about a previous body from a previous killing on the previous phase of the moon, on the full moon, on the fifth. So, you just forgot something you brought up, like, literally half a page ago. Additionally... When the authorities show up, they're not just going to see an unconscious orangutan and not actually check its system. You didn't kill it. You didn't get rid of it. 
you tranked it and left it face down on a sidewalk in New York City. There are actual people that will be able to go in and see, oh hey, someone tranked this orangutan. Hmm, maybe that's kind of suspicious. Additionally, it also seems really, really super duper unlikely that he was planning on two people and they just happened to be here in exactly the right spot for these sigils at exactly the right time to be attacked by this orangutan who just happened to be very agitated enough to kill them. Things you kind of wonder about. So, how do I feel about this? Am I optimistic? Not really. <laughs> This seems like the author putting himself into disposable characters, trying to build them up, wasting a lot of time doing it, for no payoff. This is like what I call a wet fart payoff, because you spend so much time building it up, and then it just sort of squeaks out in a wet fart, and it's embarrassing for everybody involved. It's not to say that the book's going to be bad, but I don't really like the writing style, and I really don't like the approach of getting us in the head of someone that's just destined to be killed off unceremoniously, and then we can't decide what even killed them. But that doesn't really keep it mysterious, it's just annoying. You can keep something mysterious in a better way than seeming to not be able to commit to something as the narrator. And this mustache-twirling asshole in the shadows, with his opinions about city sanitation, it's just kind of like, okay, thank you, are we getting to know the maniacal ritual killer now? Do we need to? Do we really want to? I don't think we do. This isn't even something that Supernatural tends to do. You know, usually you have someone who may have their reasons for doing something, but typically you don't get a big peek inside their head, and we don't really need one. We didn't need to be inside anyone's head here. We should have been firmly third person. This chapter took way too long to actually finish and do what it needed to do, and there was a whole lot of padding in it. Hopefully next chapter will be a little bit better, since we're actually going to see Sam and Dean, and they're actually going to have something to do with the plot. But if it's anything like the first chapter, they're probably going to talk about their pasts a lot, we're going to be jumping between the two brothers' heads, and then something stupid's going to happen, and we're going to end the chapter being really disappointed. If you enjoyed this, subscribe, follow, follow me on social media, there's links in the blurb below, I'll see you next time for another episode of So Wrong, So Right. Bye!